So, uh, my name's Lydia Cranston, I'm one of the local pharma councillors, and today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. James Milner from Massey University, also one of my colleagues. Um, and today, just to make sure you're in the right room, he's going to present on uh, the use of native shrubs in hill country. So this uh, research is part of the, the Beef and Lamb Hill Country Futures project. And um, previously, so James's area of research is in uh, farm forestry and, and cropping. Uh, previously had a big area of research in planted manuka. And Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll just... Uh, give a little bit of a, um, a brief introduction to myself. So, um, yeah, James Milner. I'm um, a long-term employee at, uh, at Massey. I've been there for uh, about 30 years. You're not <laughs> There's a few people in the room that uh, I have taught in the past. G'day, Grace. Howdy. <laughs> um, I grew up on a uh, hill country farm in the, uh, in the Taiabi area. Um, place called uh, Mohuanga, which is on the road between Kaipi and Napier. Learned to fish and um, went to, uh, right by the river, I had to go fishing. And um, went, to, um, went to Massey University in the, in the 1970s. Um, I was the oldest of seven kids. Yep, Catholic family. Um, and uh, went to university because um, taking him to the farm wasn't going to be an option. And uh, went to university and um, I learned lots of things there, uh, including how to drink. But I'm going to talk to you today about a project which, um, as, as Lydia said, is part of the Beaton Lambs Hill Country Futures project. Um, it's, it's just one aspect of, uh, if you like, the, the Forages project, um, which is running at Lincoln <laughs> University. Um, so I'm contributing this section here, which is looking at the opportunity to utilize native shrubs, uh, if you like, as a, as a refuge in your country. So um, we often get regeneration, often starting with manuka. Manuka is one of those shrubs which is, uh, acts in the pioneer, uh, acts as a pioneer. But um, the, the second successional uh, species coming through are potentially interesting because we know that um, um, in natural settings, goats and deer will certainly nail them, they'll certainly eat them. Um, so we just want to ask a few questions. Can we um, utilise these shrubs to provide some of the environmental benefits associated with woody vegetation uh, in your country? Uh, and what are the implications um, if we put livestock into them? So this is... Um, This is an example of uh, the damage that your country can suffer when uh, things go wrong. So one of the things that we have to talk about when we're talking about hill country, um, the environmental issues. That is um, some damage that occurred in hill country in coastal Hawke's Bay in 2011. And um, some of those farms, I think, are struggling still to recover from that. None of, the, none of them uh, had paddocks that were capable of holding stock. The infrastructure's been smashed. Um, actually, the farms couldn't hold stock, so uh, animals were just wondering where they were. Uh, you've got sediment ending up in uh, waterways. Um, there are all sorts of economic and environmental issues associated with that sort of damage. You can't control that sort of damage with pasture. It has to be in, in woody vegetation. It just has to be. Now, if you start talking uh, about Pinus radiata to uh, farmers, um, some of them have embraced Pinus radiata. Um, my neighbor has um, just finished planting 22 hectares, so he's not too worried about it. But a lot of farmers start frothing at the mouth. They really start frothing at the mouth. They, they lose it. They get pretty animated when you start talking about pine trees. Um, so th there are alternatives, and uh, the natives is an example of an alternative. Uh, once that hill country has eroded like that, it is 
doomed to produce very little pasture for about the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years, depending on what their uh, annual uh, pre precipitation is, rainfall is. It takes a long time for the organic matter to recover, and you never grow the grass that you once did uh, on that hill face. You never do. Um, there are all sorts of costs associated with um, farming that sort of country, and when you suffer those sorts of uh, that sort of damage, um, it becomes prohibitive. So what do you do? Finus radiata, as I've just said, um, it's a shame that a lot of farmers haven't utilised the opportunity to convert some of that rough country into Finus radiata because um, you know if it's done well, it can be profitable. It's certainly at the moment profitable. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Logging trucks are uh, operating. Out. I've got some um, shears in a couple of forests in the Gisborne region and um, they're, they're going along nicely at the moment, they've been, they've been felled and um, they send me a check every now and then, so that's nice. Um, one of the other traditional uses uh, of trees in hill country causes the, the space poplars and a lot of farmers do utilise that option. It's not cheap though. Um, the cost of poles and planting. Um, they do keep the hillside up if you've got densities um, sufficient to generate. You're looking for, you're looking for uh, 30 tonnes of uh, root biomass per hectare. So you want, you, want, you want to stop hillsides sliding. That's the amount of root material, the root biomass you need per hectare is 30 tonnes. Those things will get there if you're planting them at about thousand stems per hectare, a thousand seedlings per hectare, they'll get to that threshold in about eight or nine years. That'll keep the hillside up. So uh, 30 tonnes of root biomass will give you about the same protection as the original forest, the indigenous forest up on those hillsides. Uh, and some people utilise, and this farmer um, has done that, this is an example, uh, this farm is at uh, Utiku. Anybody know where Utiku is? <coughs> My uncle's farm. So you can cut them down and utilize them as forage. Seasonal. But native shrubs are also an option. Uh, and we wanted to have a look at um, some of the issues associated with utilising native shrubs uh, in hill country. There are some significant potential benefits. Um, you know, indigenous shrubs are necessary if you're going to encourage um, quite a number of, of our indigenous birds. Those that uh, rely on nectar, those that rely on fruit, uh, they, they can't utilise pine shrubs. Right we need indigenous plants to support uh, indigenous uh, animals. Uh, we can certainly use it for shelter. Uh, we think we can use it for forage. Um, it won't be something that you do every month. Uh, it may not be something you do every year, but probably uh, we can. Uh, and there are also some cultural issues as well. Um, a lot of people think that um, we should utilise indigenous plants as much as possible. Some of the questions associated with the use of native shrubs in hill country, well, um, you know, What's their productivity? Um, and if we're going to use them for forage, are they high quality forage, low quality forage? What is the what is the feed value of these shrubs? Um, this project, we're also having a look at the, the Mataranga Maori of uh, a number of shrubs. Um, there is more traditional knowledge out there than we realise. And um, one of my PhD students who works up in the um, in the Wairau area, is about to run a series of Wainanga, uh, and so she has invited uh, people that she thinks will have some traditional knowledge, um, and um, that will be catalogued, uh, and we're just gonna put that knowledge alongside the contemporary knowledge and see if there's any common ground, see if there's overlap, and see if there's complementarity. Um, some of the issues with using native shrubs well, um, we know that it's um, 
it's bloody expensive. Um, it's probably probably a minimum of ten thousand dollars a hectare, but could easily be double that. So um, it's not something that you do because um, waking up Sunday morning and had a religious experience. It's, it takes a fair bit of planning, uh, especially financial planning, to start converting a significant area into uh, into natives. Um, is it profitable? We've done a little bit of economic modelling so far, and um, um, you know you're not going to make a lot of money out of uh, grazing native shrubs. You might uh, you might cover some of the bills because of uh, the carbon credits that, that they are capable of earning. Uh, and at the current price of carbon credits, it's actually not too bad. Um, where will the price of carbon go in the next 10 or 20 years? Where's it going to go? Up or down? data on honey from from Monica? Honey? Yeah. That's also a potential source of income. Absolutely. Yep. Um, did any of you see that headline? Uh, oh, it was a few months ago. A little week. Well, it's not that little, I suppose, but it's based just south of the Dannyberg at Oringi, the True Honey Company. See a, um, a headline associated with that company? Might have been a stitch up, but they were selling 250 gram jars of honey in Harrods for how much? $5,000, wasn't it? Wouldn't you feel pretty special if you opened up one of those 5,000 jars of Manuka honey and spread that on your toast? Mm -mm. So, um, the objectives of this research are assess the potential benefits of different shrubs. Uh, in hill country. So these are the species we're working with. Mahoe, uh, Taupata, Karamu, um, Kauheri, Papauma, Baofalpaka, Karo, and uh, we're utilising uh, Salix, one of the browse willows. Salix is a standard. So that's a, a shrub that we have utilised uh, in the past. We know a little bit about it. We have uh, measured its productivity. We've measured its uh, palatability, its feed quality. So that's, if you like, uh, the standard that we're comparing things to. So we've got a number of sites. Um, we've got a trial on uh, message number four. There's an escarpment there, which we've utilized as for a trial. Um, we've got uh, a fairly large trial at uh, Tuapaka, which is a hill country farm, sort of between, halfway between our country and the Gorge Road, up under the windmills. In fact, three of the big windmills are on the back of Tuapaka. Um, we've got a trial site at Mahia, or well, we had a trial site at Mahia. One of the things um, that are uh, really problematic for um, young shrubs of any description uh, are goats. Um, there's a lot of goats at Mahia. And we, we were given assurances by the gentleman who owns the property or manages the property. No, I'll fix those goats. I'll fix those goats. Well, he probably had, but um, yeah, goats, they come and go as they want. So we had a trial there at Mahia. And we've also utilised a farm um, that Massey has a fair bit of uh, input into um, up in the uh, Waikato area, um, Limestone Downs. So that's the trial site uh, at Massey number four. So you can see a whole lot of shrubs, and um, we've got most of the species that I've just talked about. Uh, growing there. So we've measured their height growth, we've measured their diameter growth, we have sampled the foliage, we have sent that foliage off to our laboratory um, and the laboratory has told us about the protein content and the energy content or the metabolizable energy content, um, the minerals and the fiber and they charge us $200 a sample to do that. It's bloody horrendously expensive. Um, this is the site at Mahia, uh, and uh, that's a, a master student, uh, Georgia. She has um, she's finished that particular project. She's graduated, uh, and she's now working uh, in the Canterbury region. Uh, and that's the Massey site. Uh, that was a couple of years ago when we planted that. Um, that's dead gorse in the back there. Only it wasn't dead. <laughs> <laughs> Gorse never dies, um, so I've got um, a few days ahead of me to um, 
do some spraying with a knapsack, which I'm really looking forward to. Those are um, members of Massey Young Farmers <laughs> Club. Uh, they were raising money for the club. I paid them 60 cents per shrub to plant that site. So um, they made a couple of thousand dollars out of that. They have um, almost all graduated now. So they're out, they're out there working, doing great things, I'm sure. So one of the things that you are probably interested in is uh, if you're going to spend uh, about the cheapest you can get these shrubs for if you buy them, buy them in trays um, is about $3.50 to $3.75 per seedling. That's about the least you'll pay for them. But they could be 4 or 5 or $6 depending on you know what size, what plant of bag, uh, just how much effort and time you can put into producing them. So um, you don't want them to die on you, you can help it. Um, We've got variable uh, survival rates. At Massey, we had a 98% survival rate. So it was fenced off, we released them, and um, there were no goats, there were no hares. There might have been one or two hares, but one of the, tech, one of the techies uh, at work um, likes to do a little bit of night shooting. He's got a license to shoot, so he took care of that problem for a little while anyway. We had um, lower survival at Bar here. It's a, it's a tougher site. It's certainly um, you know, it's summer dry. Uh, and when the old Nor'westers get going in Mahia, yeah, that could be, ooh, I thought Manor 2 was bad, but um, they're pretty bad up there too. Um, differences between species, uh, caramu. Anybody tell me what the uh, botanical name of caramu is? Caprosma robusta. Very good. Uh, and the other, the other caprosma is also pretty good, caprosma repens. It's the one with the shiny leaf, often used in gardens. There are different variegated forms that you'll find uh, in the garden, different named cultivars. That's also pretty good. Um, Mahoe, less than 40% survival. I've got uh, Mahoe at, um, at Tuapaka compared with uh, broadleaf papuuma and uh, caprosma repens. The um, survival in, in the comprisma and um, broadly has been pretty good. Mahoe, every time it, it sees an opportunity to die, it seems to take it. With. <laughs> Did you see any difference in where you source the seedlings from, like locally sourced ones versus? You know? Yeah, we have um, at the at the Massey site. We've got um, local Manor Two ecotypes and. For two species, we've got Hawke's Bay ecotypes. Not seeing anything that suggests that it's. Yeah. Certainly, with some species like Manuka, um, there can be big differences between ecotypes. If you look at um, the Northland strain, for example, um, versus some of the Southern North Island strains, um, I don't know, in trials we had near the Taupo area, you bring in Northland Manuka and plant it around Taupo. I've never seen um, manuka blown out of the ground by frost, but um, Northland manuka in Taupo, bad frost damage. Uh, we have been getting uh, up to 60 centimetres a year in height growth, and that's in the caprosmas. They're, they're vigorous early on, so they've been, they've been going well. Um, oh, here uh, which is the lace bark. Some people call it ribbon wood, but it's lace bark. Uh, that's also been pretty good. Which species did you plant? Was it six the lace bark that you planted here? Or was it something else? No, no, just the normal hair. Yep. Yep. So there are differences between uh, species and survival and growth. Uh, that's early on. Now, uh, you know, these things are long-lived plants, uh, so we need to be careful about making um, big uh, conclusions um, before we're ready. We've also had a look at the forage quality. Um, the, the foliage of these shrubs is pretty attractive to animals based on uh, those ME values. So uh, ME values from just under 11 to 12 and a half, 
but it's easily as good as uh, pasture. Uh, that's as good as good quality pasture. No troubles at all. Uh, they also eat stems. Animals will eat the stems, uh, but they'll eat less, uh, and not surprisingly, um, the metabol metabolizable energy content of the stems is a little bit lower. These are um, easily comparable to uh, willow leaf, and, and uh, the stems the same. And, and we know that animals will quite happily eat willow. Protein, uh, you can only sum it up as uh, generally low. Most uh, leaf had less than 10% protein, uh, and the stems were very low. So um, it's probably probably useful as maintenance fee for this. Uh, I'm not sure we'd, we'd grow lambs uh, for month after month, but as a maintenance fee, short-term maintenance fee, it can be done. Any questions about that? Have you done much research on places that are native, like just regenerating by themselves that can be planted? Yeah, we have, we've had a look at um, uh, up in the Waikato um, limestone downs, yeah, natural, naturally regenerated. Mm. And there are some farmers also in the uh, Mahead area who are starting to graze areas which have been naturally regenerated. Carefully, very carefully. Do, do you think then there could be some type of like, controlled maintenance in a, in a regenerated block or a planted block that would still, over time, it could still add to the, the biomass in that, in that block? So you could have sort of controlled grazing if you came in for a period of maintenance with a ewe or something, some form of stock on those natives, but still be adding to that block? Yep, I envisage uh, you don't start grazing them until the you've got sufficient height uh, so that the animals that you're browsing with uh, can't come over the top. Um, and I think sheep would be preferable to cattle because cattle just tend to smash their way to wherever they want to go. Uh, but sheep are definitely feasible. Uh, and so long as your shrubs are, you know, one and a half, two metres tall when you start, you can take some leaf off at the bottom, but you're still going to you know, retain that ability to increase in height. Uh, and so long as you're not doing it all the time, and so long as you allow them to recover, you'll still accumulate biomass. Did you release the plants or was there any maintenance? Uh, yes, we did release. Um, I used a combination of, uh, unfortunately, very expensive uh, herbicides. So Versatil and Galant, those are um, trade names. Um, they're, um, you can buy the chemicals, they're all patent, but actually the the knockoffs are about the same price as the originals. It's, they're obviously very expensive uh, compounds to make. So Galant for the grass and uh, Versatil for uh, the broadleaf weeds. At Tua Parker, I came, uh, we started, we actually pre-sprayed uh, the whole damn thing. So um, went over the top with uh, Roundup or glyphosate at quite a high rate. Um, and if I'd, if I'd been really, really brave, I'd have put a little bit of Simazine in. Now for Manuka, um, glyphosate with Simazine can give you some good knockdown and residual control. The Simazine is really good at taking out uh, regenerating seedlings. But um, my weeds man told me that he couldn't guarantee that the shrubs I was planting uh, weren't going to be spooked by that Simazine, so um, I chickened out. But for Manuka, I definitely would. I'd use Simazine. So I had to follow up with uh, Galant a year later uh, on the two parker side. It's, 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 it's expensive. What's the plan for the bit that's um, like great other grazing, but you know, sort of spray the grass out or, or whatever? Um, obviously, if you're part of a grazing plan for sheep down the track, how do you, do you have good fiber and grass and put the rest of the out of foot here? No, it, it gets pretty rank and rough. And that's um, part of the gig. Part of the gig, yep. Is the poplar valley just similar to a willow? The uh, uh, poplar may be just a little bit less. Yep. And depends on the clone. Some of the clones that are, uh, surprise, surprise, you know, they've been bred for resistance to possums. Not too palatable. 
Were there any stand-out natives as far as, you know, as far as better sort of energy or anything like that, like broadly? Did that, did that stand out in any way? Um, no, broadly it didn't. The caprosmus were good. Yeah. Yep. The were definitely good. Uh, and Mahoe is also pretty good. One of the old names for uh, Mahoe was cow leaf. That tells you something. Uh, we've done a little bit of um, bioeconomic modelling with a thing called Stella, which I won't get into. Uh, it's just that, uh, just to demonstrate that um, we are modelling uh, flock dynamics associated with using shrubs. You know, we're taking out ground, we're growing less pasture, we're growing some biomass because we've got it in shrubs. Um, the effect on our feed supply. Um, we've got the economics uh, and this model allows us to, over a long period of time, generations, uh, just model income, expenditure uh, and use stuff like uh, discount cash flow analysis uh, to suggest whether or not we're wasting our time and wasting our money. Um, just suffice to say that given current prices for uh, carbon, um, holding our own. The challenge is um, coming up with the money uh, to plant a significant proportion of the hill country farm uh, in this state. In this modeling guys, do you have any way of including the value of, you know, protecting soil structure and protecting, you know, preventing what we saw earlier on or is that too difficult to I think you could <coughs> include it. We don't have that in the model at this point. But um, you know, we know that if you can um, if you can reduce erosion on your hill country farms, you reduce maintenance costs. Yeah. 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 Um, some of the some of the pertinent facts associated with economics: at least ten thousand dollars a hectare. Um, there are things like establishment costs that are important: the carbon price, the discount rate. Uh, whenever you are, are worrying about cash flow over time. Discount rate has a big influence. Um, and um, we've also just been utilizing the carbon lookup tables, MPI's carbon lookup tables. I think there's a there's a fair prospect that those carbon lookup tables for indigenous forests um, may be about to lift. There's a bit of pressure to lift them because um, a lot of the original data came from <coughs> regenerating native forest. Uh, which tends to be found in some of the, you know, the, the back country, high altitude, lower fertility, you know, the rough areas. Uh, but if we plant these shrubs on, on hill country farms, uh, that are, you know, comparatively, um, land of milk and honey, um, you know, I think we can, I think we can generate uh, better uh, accumulation rates, and I think the lookup tables may reflect that in the future which will be a bonus for those people looking for carbon credits from natives. Uh, we are at the moment undertaking uh, feed preference trialling. Uh, so we've got uh, four species, Caro, which is um, a Phytosporum, Phytosporum crassifolium, uh, Katamu, Mahoe, uh, and Hapoema, that's from New Zealand broadleaf. Uh, and we are feeding them to, these are hoggets basically, they're not quite one year old yet. Um, they've been trained, they're quiet, they're used to being handled. We put them in a pen with two containers like that. So that is uh, a container which is full of caro. And uh, alongside we'll have another container just like that with either a, a sample full of pasture, cut pasture, uh, or one of the other shrubs. So each shrub will be compared to the others and with pasture. So we've, we've done one week, we've given the animals a break, um, and then because um, our animal ethics um, approval said we have to give the animals a break. It's very difficult to work. Working with animals is more difficult than working with people. If, we, if I wanted to do a trial and you know abuse the hell out of you, that'd be all right. But <coughs> as soon as I'm working with sheep and cattle, my goodness. Ooh. Anyway. Um, 
Do they get a mat to stand on with the grass as well? <laughs> yes, they do. And they like to sit on that mat because that's not cold concrete. Yeah. But they, they run into there. They look forward to that. Open the gate, let me in. Um, that is um, one, of the, one of the shrubs that has been relatively popular. That's um, popular, Kara. Uh, and the other shrub that they have uh, shown a distinct preference for, they'll go to the shrub before they'll go to the pasture. Uh, and that's caramu. Now I'm sure that uh, many of you know what caramu looks like and, and you'll be aware that if animals get access to caramu, uh, they'll nail it if they can. Uh, and that was, um, that was before they were uh, shorn, we were training them. You have to actually train them to, to you know, get used to the facilities. And that's, um, that's a bit of caramu there. They were more than happy to munch on that. So we've weighed what the sheep are given. They've got five minutes. Clock's ticking, five minutes. Five minutes, it's going. And then we weigh what's left and we've measured the stem diameter. So they'll, they'll chew from the, you know, the, the, chop, the soft tender bits and uh, we're measuring the stem diameter at the point where they've uh, said, nah, that's a bit too tough, I'll stop there. So just a brief summary, forage quality, relatively high but low protein. Uh, most of the species that we've been looking at are better than willow in terms of its, its forage quality. Uh, and definitely suitable as a maintenance feed. Uh, productivity is certainly uh, variable, but you know, we're only a couple of years into it really. Uh, and the two caprosma species, Kalpata and Karamu, uh, definitely appear to be promising at the early stages. Uh, future work, we've uh, got a feeding trial uh, planned. It probably won't happen until next year. Uh, we're doing some work on shrub allometrics. That's basically just having a look at um, some of the metrics that tell us how much total biomass, how much leaf biomass there is above ground. So we measure the diameter uh, of, a, of a, a bush or a tree. That gives us a pretty good measure of total woody biomass and leaf biomass uh, above ground at that point, uh, which is useful for modelling. Um, and we also tend, uh, intend to, at the Firth Park site, uh, turn sheep out into those shrubs once they get above that, that we're unlikely to uh, have too much damage. To see what response uh, we get from the shrubs, we don't, we don't think they'll appreciate being browsed but we suspect that if we give them sufficient recovery time, uh, they'll sail along. <coughs> what about grazing during a drought? Often you want them made in the seed and it's really dry, but obviously the plants are dry. And that's when we intend to, to graze them because we think that that's the most probable time it'll happen. Yep. Uh, and, and, and natural stands, and I've had the, I've had the, uh, the privilege of watching deer do this, uh, and natural stands, when it gets a little bit dry, a lot of those shrubs will drop their leaves. They'll drop the, and um, the windfall uh, is fodder. And, and deer and, and goats certainly will eat it. And I suspect sheep and cattle will too. Um, we're having a bit of a look at uh, the effect of, on, of these shrubs on internal parasites. Um, we, we're fairly sure that some native shrubs do have um, anthelmintic properties. Um, one in particular, but um, it's not included in the list that we've got. Um, the Matarangi Mare, I have mentioned already. Um, some of the limitations associated with this, um, these are long-lived plants. Uh, you know, they're gonna be around for 20, 30 years, minimum. Uh, so, we're only just starting. Um, I'd like to have uh, greater representation throughout the country. Uh, and there are a few other shrub species, uh, these are called early successional species, uh, I haven't got. But you don't need to do so much. Um, the resilience of hill country farms, how does this uh, contribute to that? Uh, well, I think we've certainly got improved environmental outcomes. There's definitely the opportunity for diversification of income, especially with carbon credits. 
Uh, and I think when you uh, identify those areas of the farm which are steep and vulnerable to erosion, probably only carrying three or four stock units per hectare, it may actually be costing you to keep it in production. Um, putting that stuff back into um, woody vegetation, I think uh, helps us uh, optimising our resources. And uh, if you can focus on the better areas of your farm, uh, you may notice, in fact, that your total productivity does not decline. And that's a common experience. A lot of, you look, if you talk to farm foresters, a lot of farm foresters will tell you, you can take out 10 or 15% of your rough country uh, and still carry the same number of stock. Still generate the same level of income. That's a common experience. That's me, thank you. Hey, you had a good slide there at the start about some serious erosion on hard hill country farming. So, uh, from your experience, would you be gung ho trying to plant a place like that with uh, natives, or you got to start from the gullies and work your way up? Yeah, once you've got um, slips like that, you're in a bit of trouble. Yep. With even planting manuka, and it, it, it goes a bit sour for a while. Yep. 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 So yeah. <laughs> Getting it before it gets to that stage is definitely uh, ideal. Is there any tests being done on the emissions from stock on items? Yeah, we um, we sent uh, leaf and stem samples up to a laboratory in Auckland, um, and they extracted rumen fluid from a cow, a nice friendly cow. So we did uh, in, in vitro. Um, digestion and measured uh, methane uh, and it was unremarkable uh, so those tests suggest that these shrubs are producing no more methane than say pasture so we can answer that question sort of but we haven't measured in, in a live animal yep. but look, laboratory testing suggests it's okay it's probably all different, but when you said um, when the shrubs have reached a certain height, um, you know, that you could put the stock on there, it would be sort of an average height, you know, so that they would recover and not just kill the shrubs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how big was that? Like, how long did you let the shrubs grow for before you put stock on there? Um, the, the, the species that I've got at Tuaparka, uh, Mahoe, Karamu and Papahuma, which is the broadleaf. Um, I, I suspect I'll be able to graze that four, maybe five years. Yep, I'd like to see them a metre and a half <coughs> before I got uh, sheep into them. Um, it'll be a lot longer with cattle, and I'll be reluctant to put cattle in. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, yeah, just wondering. Um, you said it was quite expensive for your startup costs, like buying your seedlings and stuff. How difficult would it be, like, if you guys were growing, like, if you decided you wanted, you had some natives on your farm already? How difficult is it to go out and collect seeds and try and have a crack at growing them yourself to try and cut that initial cost? Yep. If you had somebody who had, uh, you know, the old green fingers and was prepared to put in some time, it's viable. Yep. That's the other thing to do is if you've got a little wee patch, um, there's often a lot of volunteer seedlings underneath. I've got a couple of hundred plants at home and, and they've all just come out of my garden basically and up the driveway. Uh, the caprosmas, uh, pittosporums, um, all kinds of pittosporums, uh, cabbage trees, uh, many more. Flaxes, I just take them out of the garden. Yep. Totra, yep. kahikatea, yeah, it is viable. A lot of work, but yeah. Right, we'll have to stop you there. Lunch is awaiting us. So thanks, guys.